thank you. Well, they had Frank. We have Dodd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there's a couple of other famous uh, financial reformers, one named Glass and one named Stiegel. And uh, Senator, I wanted to start by asking you, the bill Dodd-Frank sort of takes the world as it is and regulates derivatives, um, uh, resolution authority, and so on, as opposed to doing something more radical and creating a different world. So what I'd love to start with is, is, is the thought process that went into creating the bill that became Dodd-Frank. Well, first of all, I can't resist. I apologize having missed my partner in crime, Barney Frank, here earlier. I gather he kept you amused uh, for a good hour and a half. I must just tell you, Joe, and uh, it was about 4 a.m. in the morning of the House and Senate conference report coming to a conclusion. And a congressman from Pennsylvania made the motion uh, to name this bill the Frank Dodd Bill. <clears throat> now, there's Barney. Barney remember that, that moment. And uh, Barney said, no, that won't work. They'll think it's one guy. And you can't have uh, just one Frank Dodd. Uh, <laughs> and I said, Barney, don't fool with me. I know what you're thinking. No one remembers Hawley's name and Smoot Hawley. So I uh, understand here that I'd be end up bearing the final burdens of all of this along the way. Uh, anyway, thank you, Hank, for doing this. And, and David Axelrod as well for having us all, all here. Well, look, Joe, uh, coming into this, after the, uh, uh, the, the TARP process, which was uh, deeply involved in as well, as was Barney and Judd Gregg, clearly, in, in our view, just walking away uh, from the idea of trying to uh, restructure, reform the financial services sector uh, to catch up with the 21st century. And there really hadn't any been major reform uh, until back in the 1930s, uh, which was good reform. The SEC, the FDIC, Glass-Steagall, in a sense, gave us roughly 60 years of pretty stable uh, uh, economic situation in the country. So we felt we ought to step up. Others had been making recommendations in fact, Hank, I recall, and uh, you, you made a series of recommendations earlier in the process about what we might do uh, to reform the process. So that was very much in our mind, uh, just the idea of walking away after the fall of 08 and saying we don't need to do anything at all. It was just a, a few things that needed to be accomplished. So very much in our mind was uh, listening. We had a lot of uh, endless meetings and discussions with people about what ought to be included in the process. And a couple of things come to mind. Uh, certain things you cannot legislate or regulate. The confidence uh, uh, of people throughout the financial services sector, including the consumers of the product, have been shattered by what had happened. So restoring confidence was critically important in my view. I was interested in hearing the keynote speaker at lunch today uh, talk about the importance of the globalization, uh, which unfortunately was not being talked about as much. But the G20 in April of 2008 made a series of recommendations on financial reform, some 20 of them. Now, Barney and I didn't go around announcing all of that, but frankly, we tracked a lot of that. I thought harmonization of rules could be terribly important, uh, because while this crisis was basically and largely a European-US one, the next one, as we certainly will come, will involve a lot many more players than just the European Union and the United States, although others were obviously affected by what occurred. And if you couldn't begin to harmonize, not duplicate, but harmonize some rulemaking uh, in all of this, uh, then it would become even a more disastrous problem in the future. So that was very much as part of the, the consideration is, as well. Uh, we weren't going to solve every problem. Uh, obviously, trying to put this bill together was going to be complicated. I offered a discussion draft in the fall of 2009, uh, which unfortunately didn't attract much support. Uh, but, but my idea was to virtually consolidate prudential regulation into a single prudential regulator, include consumer protection within that prudential regulation. Uh, so you'd have some sort of a complement between consumer regulation and prudential regulation. I got about three votes, I think, for that proposal. <laughs> I, I think today people might look at it more favorably than they did in the fall of 2009, uh, but I would have liked to have done more consolidation. We ended up, of course, eliminating one, but we added two. So we had a right. net gain of one uh, regulator in the process. So those were some of the basic thoughts. And obviously this wasn't uh, an executive decision. I had 99 colleagues in the Senate. Barney had 500, 435 members of the House. You had stakeholders, obviously the administration and others, putting together a proposal. Uh, in the Senate, I had to have 60 votes. I lose one vote, and it's just a discussion. It's a nice conversation, but nothing happens at all. So putting that together requires, obviously, accepting ideas and thoughts, some of which I didn't vote for when we had the debates on the floor of the Senate. I didn't have much of a partner on the other side, uh, the Republican Party, and I say that regretfully. Uh, and trying to come together with more of a bipartisan approach. Uh, 
but in the end, uh, that wasn't going to happen, and so I had to deal with the members that uh, were at the table and interested in putting some of a proposal uh, together. So those were the basic ideas mm -hmm. as we began the process. Obviously, a lot happened between that point and the final product, but that was at least the motivations uh, when we began the, uh, the journey of trying to come up with a, a structure. You could not have done this, by the way, in 2005, 2006, or 2007, or even 2008. You couldn't have done it in 2011 or 2012. The one window that you had a chance to do something in was the one we operated in. Uh, and had we failed in that view, uh, my view was that I think we'd look back with deep regret uh, that we didn't really respond except through TARP uh, to address the underlying uh, causes that led us to the crisis uh, that culminated in the events of, of September 2008. Mary, from the point of view as somebody who was in the administration, the head of the SEC, um, how did it, and then you get this bill, and it's got a lot into it, and how much of it, I mean, when you look at it, how hard was it to implement from your point of view? Um, what, you know, it's not like they were giving you more money to do this. Okay. And, and what pieces of it do you think really made sense versus maybe a piece or two that didn't make that much sense? Sure. So I arrived at the SEC in January of 2009, much of the heavy lifting um, done by um, Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson and Tim Geithner and others had already been done. And we started to work right away on both rebuilding the SEC but also thinking about legislative reform and how we could engage in the process. And from my perspective, there were a couple of things that were really important and those got done, a couple of things that were important that didn't get done. Um, but um, obviously after the legislation is done, much of the burden falls to the regulatory agencies to implement. And the SEC was given responsibility for close to 100 new rules, um, most of which have been either adopted or proposed, but there's still a long way to go. I think the really critical pieces from my perspective was the regulation of the over-the-counter derivatives market. Um, unfortunately, um, to the issue about uh, restructuring and rationalizing our regulatory structure, we have two agencies that are sharing responsibility for this $600 trillion market and two sets of parallel rulemakings, which might have been more easily accomplished had we just merged the SEC and the CFTC, which I think would have made sense. But getting that market so that we have pre- and post-trade transparency, we have centralized clearing, we have business conduct standards, I think is an incredibly important response to the financial crisis. Um, I would say resolution planning, and we, we've heard a lot about that uh, this morning, the creation of the CFPB. Um, from our perspective, again, hedge fund registration, not because the SEC is actively regulating hedge funds, but because we didn't even know what how many hedge funds were out there and what their strategies were. So the requirement for them to come in and, and, and talk to the regulators and explain what they were doing I think was really useful. And one that might surprise a little bit is, um, while I think it would have been better if we could have consolidated our regulatory system, the workaround for that is something I supported, which was the creation of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. It's a bit unwieldy. It's a, it's a big body of all the regulators, with, including some state representation. But it is a good mechanism for sharing uh, information about um, financial institutions and, and risks to the financial system, which I think has created um, a much more seamless dialogue uh, in Washington about how to approach uh, regulatory problems. In terms of what's not done, there are two things I, I would point to. Um, money market fund reform, which um, some steps were taken uh, in 2010 to bolster the resiliency of money market funds. Um, but the reality is um, I believe they still present a, a run risk. There were enormous uh, complications, and you can read this in Hank's book, when the prime reserve fund broke the buck in the fall of 2008, started a run on money market funds, $300 billion withdrawn within the space of a week, short-term credit markets froze, investors lost access to their money in prime reserve, and um, Treasury and the Fed had to step in with a taxpayer-funded guarantee program for a uh, nearly $4 trillion industry. Um, that represents an investment product, not a, not a uh, depository product, although it's treated for regulatory purposes as it does. And the second thing I think um, is that we now have this great new regulatory regime that's coming into effect for over-the-counter derivatives, for hedge funds, for others, but we haven't funded the agencies that have ultimate responsibility for making sure that those regulatory regimes work. So I'm actually worried about a new kind of moral hazard, 
and that is that um, people think, great, over-the-counter derivatives are now regulated when you have a little tiny agency like the CFTC is now furloughing its employees um, for 12 days for the rest of the year uh, in order to uh, come in uh, at their budget number. They have 95% of the responsibility for this market, and they have no capacity to do uh, an appropriate regulatory job. And the same can be said, a little bit less true of the SEC. We have a bigger base to start with. But um, there's, there's no capacity there to ensure these rules are, in fact, being followed. Randy, um, one part of the bill is the resolution authority. Uh, and there's so much, to this day, uh, question about whether if a Bank of America or a city were getting ready to fail, would you actually use, would the government actually use the resolution um, that they have, authority that they have, or would there be another sort of panic and instant desire to, to save the institution? Um, what do you think about that in terms of what the bill does and says? Well, the principles are sensible ones, to make sure that we have um, some sort of structure that allows us to have an orderly wind down of an institution that's in trouble, regardless of the size and regardless of what, what its activities are. There's still not a lot of flesh on the bones. Uh, the, um, uh, the outline in, in Dodd-Frank is, you know, gives a fair amount of uh, leeway to the FDIC and to the others to, to put it together, which I think makes sense. Uh, but we're still really waiting to see what that looks like. So in principle, it could be used in a sensible way. And I think um, there's a lot of optimism that it will be. The flesh that has come out seems to have made the, uh, the credit rating agencies um, somewhat happy. They've been talking about potentially um, uh, downgrading the so-called with support ratings, because they give banks uh, the regular rating plus a so-called with support rating, because they think that it may be less likely that uh, the, uh, the government would intervene to provide the, uh, provide the support. But I think we're, uh, we're, we're not there yet. And I think one of the key things is really thinking about the consequences of an institution going down. Because when I was there at the Fed from 2006 to 2009, the easy years, of course, uh, <laughs> there were one of, the cons one of the concerns we had is, you know, I'm a University of Chicago guy. I certainly go, did not go down to Washington hoping that we were going to have lots of bailouts and supports and all that. Uh, and that was not, not my, my focus. But when you're in the moment, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the consequences are of one of these institutions going down. And that both legal uncertainty and more market uncertainty, I think, is one of the greatest things that leads, greatest pressures that leads the supervisors and regulators and others to act because of the unknowns about what will, will go on. If we could focus more on a lot of the boring infrastructure of, you know, the sexy stuff is orderly resolution authority, but when you start talking about, you know, moving over-the-counter derivatives onto centrally cleared platforms, by the, end, the time you finish the end of the phrase, everyone's asleep. Or the tri-party repo system, or all of these things that, um, that make a very big difference. If an institution goes down, does that cause a ripple or a tsunami? It's much more about the infrastructure and making markets ro more robust than just some of these, these other specifics. And I don't think we've, we've spent enough time on some of these more boring plumbing issues uh, rather than on you know, some of these bigger picture things. Um, David, you, were, you had left the government by the time the reform was, uh, yeah. was underway. Uh, but you had been deeply, deeply involved in the crisis itself. So as somebody from the outside looking in, were there reforms that you thought should have been part of it just based on your experience and weren't? Or, or was the bill that they, you know, how, how do you characterize uh, what the government did uh, in, in the aftermath? Um, well, Senator Dodd alluded to, to some of the things that Hank had uh, proposed while, uh, while I was at the Treasury. And, and this is a, an area where Hank was pretty prescient. He knew that there needed to be some pretty significant regulatory reform even before the crisis hit. So if, if you think about something that we worked on while, while I was there, it was looking at our regulatory infrastructure. And there are a couple of themes associated with that. It was thinking about rationalizing the regulatory architecture. It was about identifying systemic risk both from the banking system and outside the banking system. It was how to deal with uh, large, complex organizations potentially failing. failing. And it was about uh, consumer protection but mostly the consumer protection was outside of the regulated banking system. And those are largely the themes in, uh, in Hank's blueprint. And kind of where we are in terms of those four themes is I'd say Dodd-Frank handled a lot of them. Uh, I think the senator is exactly right. He put together a proposal that did rationalize the, uh, the regulatory structure. And I wish that that advanced further. And I bet people would, be, people would take that up more now. 
Um, on the CFPB stuff, I'm not sure. So they have the authority to spend their time outside of the banking system, which was a lot of where the real consumer issues happened. They haven't exercised that authority yet, so they get an incomplete on that because they're spending a lot of time in the banking sector. Uh, the resolution authority concept is there. Mm -hmm. uh, like Randy, I, th I think it's the tools are there and the plumbing is there. I mean, I think too big to fail is a misnomer. It's really too big to be liquidated quickly. And if you can give the government authority in order to manage that liquidation, you've basically managed the biggest issue, which is confidence in the sector. And then lastly, the systemic risk issue. So systemic risk is a massive, is a massive sea change in how, in how we think about the regulatory architecture in the United States. It remains to be seen whether or not that architecture is going to be used for a lot of institutions outside of the banking sector. So we'll see. But I, I think Dodd-Frank embodies a lot of the concepts that, uh, that Hank put forward when we were there. You know, I don't, they haven't really done a lot yet, although they have done some with payday lending. But I, it does feel to me as though the CFPA, the new Consumer Bureau, does want to um, dive into the non-bank sector. It's a huge, it's a huge problem. It's a very big undertaking. It's something to get your arms around. We spent a lot of time trying to get a sense of, you know, how can the federal apparatus deal with state licensed entities, entities that have a direct impact on the banking system but aren't part of the regulatory structure. So we'll see if they do it. It's a big, big, it's a big issue and a big task, and uh, they have the authority to do so. So a few years after the, uh, after the bill, actually, we have the London whale trade. The JP Morgan $6 billion loss uh, this is supposed to be the best run of the banks. Um, uh, you know, this sort of thing is not supposed to happen. And, um, you know, the first thing I want to ask about that is, what is that, su does that suggest anything about Dodd-Frank or no, no Dodd-Frank, or has, have things changed internally at banks? And it would seem to me on the face of it that the answer is no, based on the trade. But Mary, what do you think? Well, I think, I, I don't want to speak specifically to uh, the London whale trade because it obviously happened while I was chairman of the SEC and, and we were very involved. But what I do, I do think what you're seeing sort of across the board from regulators with respect to increased enforcement actions, significantly increased penalties uh, and focus is that um, it's really driving the industry to a, a much more deeply embedded focus on risk management um, as a cultural matter, not as a check the box matter, and and I think um, and I think that's actually going to be a good thing. It, will it be a little bit of a drag? Maybe, but I would say the financial crisis has been a little bit of a drag too, and um, <laughs> the idea that people can um, embed within the businesses and um, throughout an organization a focus on on compliance and a focus on risk management. Uh, Will will be a very um, will be a very beneficial thing over the long run. I think it also argues for um, tremendous transparency between regulated firms and their and their regulators, so that there aren't uh, surprises like that. You know, let me just follow up quickly. Um, it does feel as though the regulators over the last six months to a year have gotten a lot tougher than they were at the beginning, and that may be um, a wrong assumption on my part, but. You know, there's a million, uh, J.P. Morgan is, is getting it from all sides right now, and um, there's, a, there's a kind of a, an ad, and they're paying billions, not just the mere 500 million that Goldman Sachs paid for Abacus. So I wanted to just ask you, as a former regular, whether it, whether it looks that way to you. You know, I think, um, look, I think, the, I, I was always stung by the criticism that the, that the SEC or the Department of Justice or CFTC didn't want to bring the big cases and didn't want to name the, the important firms. And, and really nothing can be further from the truth. There's nothing a prosecutor in a criminal context or a civil enforcement lawyer in the civil context wants to do more than bring the big case. The reality is um, the federal government has awesome power and it's got to be exercised responsibly. That means you've got to have the law and the facts on your side. It takes a long time to build those cases and so some of this I think is just the natural time consuming process of building an investigative record uh, and, um, and, and bringing the actions. But I think um, we want, I think as a society, for people to, to do that in the most responsible possible way. Um. The Volcker Rule. Let's talk about that for a few minutes. It's, um, it's a really complicated situation. The attempt is to um, prevent banks for, from, from doing most proprietary trading. Um, uh, Senator, why, why wasn't it 
you know, why didn't it make the, uh, the early rounds of the bill? Well, because uh, Paul Volcker hadn't testified yet, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was some discussion about it earlier. It wasn't as if it was uh, not talked about at all. There was discussion about, about proprietary trading. And, and everyone, I think, agrees that on, on a one level, if you look at it one-dimensionally, that obviously gambling with other people's assets here is something you want to put the brakes on. Uh, about. There's no argument about that, per se. It's when you start getting to the legitimate areas of, of hedging, for instance, at interest rates and a variety of other areas, that, that you need to have proprietary trading to some degree. And, uh, and I thought Paul made a good case. Uh, his testimony wasn't the best, in my view, because it left a lot of questions in people's minds. And, and when you get into the subject matter, it gets complicated. If this were easy, obviously, uh, we would have dealt with the rules a lot earlier, but it is complicated. I, I, I get asked the question all the time about uh, uh, how we settled on, on 3%. And I, I, I love to tell audiences, look, it was very complicated. I brought together the best economists in the world. We sat around for a week and had a long conversation about what the rate ought to be. There were a bunch of people who thought it ought to be 10%. There were others who thought it ought to be zero. But I could get 60 votes for three. Uh, I'd love to tell you it was more complicated than that. Uh, but in many ways, you're putting a bill together. And, and, uh, and, and while other people have brilliant ideas and arguments to make, it, when you're trying to fashion a piece of legislation, in dealing with 99 colleagues and 435 in the House, uh, you, you deal with what you have, in a sense. And, and so uh, th I'd love to tell you it was more sophisticated than that, uh, uh, but that's about how you come out with that number. And I don't think we're unique. You go back throughout the history of the Republic, you'll find in one case after another, putting bills together is more than just giving a speech somewhere. You've got to listen to your colleagues, and you've got to work with them in order to achieve those results. So I have a lot of confidence. I, I saw what Jack Lew recently suggested, that uh, putting aside the shutdown for 17 days or so, that that in fact uh, the, the various regulatory bodies will deal with this, they hope, by either the end of the year or the early part of next year, and I hope that's the case. Obviously, I think both Barney and I would wish this were done earlier, but I think most of us feel getting it right <laughs> is more important than getting it quick. <laughs> uh, and so while this is taking time, in the long run, I think we're going to be a better place because we've spent some time trying to get it right rather than rushing something through that we look back and regret. There's nothing Talmudic about the Dodd-Frank legislation. <laughs> Nothing biblical about this. We did the best we could in putting this together. And I think Barney, if he didn't say it this morning, I'm sure would agree with me on this. And that is, we need to have oversight of this process. Uh, did we do as well as we thought we were doing in certain areas? Anytime you're dealing with a subject matter this large, this complicated, there are always going to be things that have the, quote, unintended consequences. And certainly it's up to the regulators, it'll be up to the Congress, the committees and so forth, to do the work. Uh, just to pick up on, on the point made on resolution authority. This piece of legislation absolutely legally prohibits doing what we did in the fall of 2008. Yeah. It's against the law now to do what we did. <laughs> Put aside whether or not that exists or not, I defy anyone to suggest to me that this Congress or any Congress would be willing to do what we did in the fall of 2008 again as a practical matter. You've got to be living on a different planet than I am to think that could happen today. Uh, now maybe in 50 years from now, when memories have totally faded, someone might come back and try something like that. But you couldn't do it. So. The resolution authority, I think, builds in some disciplines in the process uh, that, are, that are critical. And we won't really know until we're confronted uh, with, with a situation. Hopefully that won't happen, in a sense, because of what we've done here. Things like the funeral plans, where we give great flexibility to institutions to decide how they would unwind. When we let you know that you're going to never again be allowed to practice in this particular endeavor, uh, that other industries are going to have to contribute, in fact, to the cost of all of this, I think has its own salutary conclusions in many ways. So to pick up what Mary was saying, that I think a lot of this will, will, uh, will help in the long term uh, provide results. One comment I wanted to make, because uh, it, I know it was received a lot of criticism, and I was uneasy about it. I think Barney may have been as well. But we thought it was worth trying. Uh, and that was the whistleblower uh, sections, uh, that the people got very nervous about what this would mean. Uh, and yet what's happened, uh, I think, Mary, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, and it's actually worked a lot better than people uh, it's think it's worked. It's worked extremely well. Yeah, and, and the assumption would be that a lot of people were just trying to collect a check uh, by, by telling tales about the, the business they were in. In fact, it's been quite the opposite of that and been very worthwhile. So those kind of things that don't get a lot of attention in the legislation, I think, are contributing to it. And I'm confident in the end the VOCA rule will work out. We'll figure out how to do this well. And, and if it's not, corrections will be made. Mary? Yeah, I have actually like to comment on, on both Volcker and Whistleblower. You know, we saw Whistleblower Authority um, to try to get people to come to the SEC 
with evidence of ongoing, um, hopefully, not hopefully, but ongoing securities fraud, um, where the SEC could take action um, as early as possible, shortcut the enormous investigative process that we actually just talked about, which is why some of these cases take so long to bring. And what we heard from corporate America was, if you do this, you will undermine our internal compliance programs. Whistleblowers right now have to go to management, try to get things resolved. Uh, they'll, they won't do that. They'll just shortcut it. They'll go right to the SEC. There's a financial incentive. And we wrote the rules in a way to actually build a financial incentive into both going internally to try to resolve your issue, but also reporting to the SEC. And um, I think um, the jury would say that um, the program has been very successful. Within a year, the SEC paid its first award. Uh, it has uh, resulted in a number of, of much better, much faster cases. And I think corporate uh, corporations would tell you it has not undermined their compliance programs. Volcker is so complex. And um, the complexity is compounded by the fact that five regulatory agencies needed to agree. Now, technically, I guess the FDIC could have done one version of Volcker, SEC could have done another, the Fed yet another, but I think that would have driven the regulated industry crazy, and, and that would not have been a good result. So trying to achieve a rule that different regulators with very different perspectives on, on markets um, it was, was complex. I mean, the SEC thinks about capital markets. We think about hedging and market making. Very different than a bank thinks about uh, issues like hedging and, and market making. And so that's really um, made it a more difficult thing to achieve. That plus there have been thousands of comment letters, hundreds of visits with uh, affected industry, um, and lots of complexity added as a result of that process. So while I think we got the first proposal out pretty quickly, uh, with everybody in agreement, um, it's always a lot harder to get the rules finalized, and this one is particularly complex and really goes to the heart of, of the business. Randy? And um, I think exactly as the Senator said, there are a lot of potential for unintended consequences of um, any, sort of, any sort of regulatory change, and making sure to be able to revisit and sort of think through what happened is incredibly important. And Volcker Rule, I think, has enormous potential for that, and I think that's one of the reasons why the, the regulators have been struggling to try to come up with a proper definition of proprietary trading, because exactly as the Senator said, it's very difficult to determine whether something is appropriate hedging for doing work for a customer, to be able to make the market for that customer, or whether it's something that's, uh, that's hedging. As someone had said, what you need in compliance for this is to have a lawyer on one side of the trader and a psychologist on the other. What are you really doing? What are you after? And it's going to be very, very difficult to do the compliance on this. And one of the things that I fear in, in, um, in uh, making so many of these regulatory changes is a lot of it will simply be about sort of check the box compliance rather than about substantive focus on the risks that are being taken. And I think Volcker runs that, uh, exactly that kind of risk because I very much agree with, with the Senator that we don't want people gambling with other people's money. That said, we do need to make markets. We do need to make sure that there are, are liquid markets. And many of our uh, regulatory brethren around the world commented negatively on Volcker because they said this is going to withdraw liquidity from quite a few markets of the world that have an unintended, uh, unintended consequence. And so I think really uh, what I worry is that what we're doing is getting the supervisors distracted from their focus, which should be looking at the risks, thinking about stress tests, scenario analysis, these kind of big picture things. And what supervisors like to do is be able to sort of say, well, here are the five things that we need to check that you are doing. The, uh, the, the financial services firm can say, yes, we've done these five things, but it's not about those five things. It's about the substance of the, the, uh, uh, the risks that are being taken. And I just worry that we're moving too much in that sort of kind of compliance direction. Well, I think one of the things we learned from the crisis is that sort of check the block box compliance is the wrong way to go. Kind of thinking about these bigger picture risks is a much better way to go rather than having the lawyer and the psychiatrist or psychologist sitting next to the trader. David, it looked like you had some thoughts on that. Well, uh, I, the first thing I was thinking is I wish I heard the 3% story before I wrote a comment letter on the Volcker rule. It would have been a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> because I agonized over how, to, how do we talk about that. Uh, the, the second thing is I, I come at it from a, a slightly different place. Randy's exactly right. I've run compliance at a big, complicated firm. It's a challenge. I mean, the, the new onslaught of regulations is a very difficult thing to deal with. But I think the Volcker rule basically is 
is rehashing a debate that we've had in the banking system for a long period of time about whether or not we want banking to be narrowly focused or broadly focused. And, and simply, simply stated, if you want the banking system to be narrowly focused because we think it has a subsidy attached to the deposit and, di and discount window access and certain activity is important enough that it needs to get that subsidy. The question is, does Volcker Rule take that subsidy and extend it too much? And I think, th and that's how you get into the, the whole debate about gambling with other people's money. I personally think the, the better way and best way to deal with that particular dilemma is to have credibility, credibility in the resolution regi regimes. Because if these large, complicated institutions could fail without putting taxpayer money at risk, people wouldn't be as worried about this particular issue. So everything that everyone said here is true. Volcker is, is hideously complicated. It is, it is the subject of a massive amount of debate between the regulatory agencies. It plays off of definitions that were never intended to be prohibitive definitions. And it's going to be something that's going to create an enormous compliance drag. And I think if we really got to what we were trying to achieve, which is making sure that that subsidy wasn't stretched to non traditional banking activities with credible resolution, we'd probably solve that problem. Um, you know, Randy, uh, Karen Petru, the bank, the well-known bank analyst, uh, has coined a phrase that she calls complexity risk, that, that, that complexity itself creates a new kind of risk for banks, um, uh, the complexity of the rules, the complexity of banking. Um, the, the really, I mean, one thing I think we did learn from the London Whale Trade is that bank, some banks are too big to be managed. Um, anyway, I don't know if you've had any thoughts on that, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. Sure, and I think it also fits in with um, the discussion of uh, Volcker rules, sort of simpler banks, because there's a lot of discussion about breaking up banks, simplifying banks, making them more monoline. But if you look at the crisis, the institutions that went down, Washington Mutual, IndyMac, uh, Wachovia was brought down by, by Golden West, these were monolines. These guys were not doing anything complicated in the traditional, in, in what we're talking about now they were doing primarily mortgage lending, doing really, really badly and taking on astonishing amounts of risk. But if you look at the institutions, at least the deposit-taking institutions that had gotten into trouble, it was, had nothing really to do with complexity. It had to do with just really, really bad underwriting. And so I think we, there's been a narrative that's been developed that somehow getting involved in all these other things was problematic. There are certainly some institutions that were problematic, but they weren't deposit-taking institutions. Those were the investment banks. And if you look at the institutions that did get into trouble, they or ones uh, got into trouble by just doing very traditional, uh, traditional kinds of things. Uh, I do think that there is a complexity risk, but I think we don't want to say that, well, complexity was sort of what got us into the mess. Um, the interconnections and uh, the, the, the complexities that came through the plumbing, I think, were very important. But um, the actual problems at the individual institutions um, in many cases, in most of those cases, those institutions were simple institutions, or I shouldn't say simple, but they were doing one set of things, not a complex, uh, complex set of things. It reminds um, me of the um, Paul Volcker statement when he was talking about the compl complexity of innovative new products when he said the only innovation in banking in the last 20 years worth anything is the ATM machine. And <laughs> he did say that. He did, and, uh, and that's quite an exaggeration, but the reality is that a lot of enormously complex products have been created and sold that were not well risk managed um, by the entities creating them. Um, I'm, we're about to turn it over to the audience. I'm going to ask one more question. If anybody wants to answer it, they can. If they don't, um, is Basel III going to make a difference? Uh, well, I hope so. I mean, I, the, you know, the sense on it was, uh, again, the, the, the very good remarks at lunch uh, on capital. And, and leverage are terribly important. I suppose if it said to Barney and I, you can only do one thing. <laughs> you can write a bill, you can only do one thing. I suspect that maybe leverage and capital would have been the one thing we would have done, uh, in a sense. We thought there was more to this story than just that. Uh, but, but my hope is, again, uh, that, that we'll end up uh, with, with something like that and strong. It looks like the numbers are going to hold up. So uh, I, I see that as a positive sign. Uh, questions? Oh, oh, great. Mr. Frank, you have a question? <laughs> yeah. uh, you get to... <laughs> Mary, but I, I really, I did want to make a prefatory comment in defense of the CFPB, which I feel paternal about. The reason they have not yet, that they are only just getting now to non-bank stuff, is that under the statute, 
They were not empowered to do that until the director was confirmed. Yeah. So the failure to, def to confirm Cordray, I believe they're now doing it. But the question is for Marion. I've been asked it, and I've been giving an answer, and I really need some reassurance. Is it accurate that a large part of the problem with not having gone after people before is that what they did may have stunk, but it wasn't illegal. Yeah. And that, in fact, one of the reasons we had to pass the bill was to make illegal some things that now on, I have noticed at least a couple of cases, the CFTC brought a case which under the new authority. So to what extent is it the problem that things that people did not think should have been done were not clear cut enough violations of, of, of the law to prosecute? There's no question that's a huge piece of it. For CFTC in particular, as you point out, they hadn't been able to prove a manipulation case in 40 years yeah. until the law was changed and gave them the tools that they needed to do that, which actually um, that section of the law mimics the securities laws. Um, but there's no question there were people who actually engaged in wrongdoing, and the SEC has sued 167 individuals and entities and gotten about a $3 billion uh, recovery um, for actual violations of the law. But much more of it was just bad judgment, um, carelessness, not understanding uh, the risks that were being taken, and those aren't violations of the law um, in most instances. So I think. Um, that's, that's certainly a piece of it. I think there's, cl there's more clarity now as a result of Dodd-Frank um, for the regulators in um, being able to pursue things that perhaps before they couldn't. You know, Joe, one of the things that, that, that picking up on Barney's point that I, that, that I regret, uh, we didn't do, and, I, and again, it comes back, and again, I, I don't want to sound like this is all politics, but certainly you're not going to get a bill done if you don't have a, a good ear. <laughs> And, and I regret that we didn't change the funding mechanism for the SEC. Uh, we did for the Consumer Protection Bureau, which I know bothers some people, but it, we, we've all watched this happen in the past of starving agencies, uh, lacking the resources and the personnel to do their jobs. And, and the problem was, Mary, I think you and I probably talked about this in the past, was I had a number of people who serve on the Appropriations Committee, and they had jurisdiction over the SEC, and they don't like giving up jurisdiction. Uh, and candidly, I thought we'd lose votes, and I couldn't lose one. <laughs> and if I lost one vote on that issue, then the bill would come down, in a sense. So I regret that we didn't get it done, because I would have liked to have had a self-funding. We've talked about it for a long time. Yeah. You know. uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, hi, I'm uh, an MBA student at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Uh, this is for Ms. Shapiro. You spoke about uh, the Goldman case, the Abacus case, so I'm going to bring this up. Uh, Joe raised it, but okay. Right. Actually, she so, didn't. I, I want to talk about the prosecution of uh, Fabrice Touré, who is actually now a PhD student at the University of Chicago. Uh, so it's an appropriate forum, I would imagine. How much of that case do you think was motivated more by sort of the SEC wanting to save face rather than it actually being pros prosecuting somebody who was responsible for the crisis, especially in the light of you know, the SEC's own failings during, say, the Madoff crisis, when they didn't find uh, the, the issues that Madoff had? that were highlighted by, say, Harry, Harry Marco Polos. So let we, me violate we, my own rule of not commenting on individual cases by saying you. I can tell you unequivocally bringing that case against Goldman Sachs and naming an individual, and it had nothing to do with saving face. It had everything to do with um, prosecuting a violation of the federal securities laws. And, um, you know, I, when I got to the SEC, I actually was nominated um, by President Obama a week after um, Bernard Madoff was arrested and, and had confessed to his Ponzi scheme. And we spent a lot of time rebuilding the enforcement program at the SEC to, rec to really record levels of results over the last several years. Um, but it, it wasn't about saving face. It was about doing what the American people had a right to expect this agency was doing, which was enforcing the law. Hello. Yes, My name is Eric Taney. I'm a graduate student at the uh, Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. My question is, um, I'd like you to weigh in on a conversation that was actually happening on campus yesterday, uh, and that is regards to uh, too big to fail versus too complex to fail. Uh, it, it was pretty much what I was, what I was suggesting in terms of too big to liquidate quickly. There's, there's kind of two ways to think about the too big to fail problem uh, and a solution to it. The, the first is, do you prefer the blunt instrument, which is if, if there is a perception that institutions are too large, then the only way to eliminate that perception unequivocally is to make people not that large. I don't think that's probably the best way to deal with it. So the other kind of more narrowly focused way to adjust it is in two ways. The first is uh, 
do the best you can on a, prudential, on a prudentially regulated basis to ensure that those institutions don't fail. So that's front-end supervision, Basel III, and all the liquidity rules and some of the results of the enhanced prudential standards of Dodd-Frank attempts to deal with that. And then secondly is put in place a credible resolution regime that people believe in that is closely tied to the bankruptcy code so that people can organize themselves around it and get, put the tools in place so that the government has the ability to instill confidence that a liquidation of a large, complicated institution will not bring down the, will not bring down the, the overall economy. If you think about Lehman Brothers, it's a $600 billion institution. That's not huge compared to the financial system as a whole. The problem with Lehman Brothers was very simple. The federal regulatory authorities did not have the ability to guarantee that amount of liabilities without TARP and without Dard Frank. Having the ability to guarantee those liabilities would have changed the entire situation significantly. We can do that after Dodd-Frank now. And the, the key on this is really, it's um, what we were talking about before, is it's really not the size of a particular institution. Because let's say there were a lot of concerns about what happened with respect to the money market funds after the reserve, reserve fund broke the buck because the, um, uh, the Lehman paper had gone down in value. Um, it really made no difference whether the money market mutual fund industry was one large money market mutual fund or a zillion of them. It was a correlated asset class. And so I think that really underscores that it's not size in and of itself. And also, one organization could be very large in a particular, uh, particularly important market and not be a large institution otherwise. And so uh, it's really about sort of the, the infrastructure, the interconnections, so that when an institution is resolved that, um, and it's taken down, the consequences sort of stop at the edge of the institution rather than go on for the entire system. And so I think it's, it's very much about that. We still have a lot to, to go on that, a lot more transparency for markets to feel comfortable. They know what the consequences are, both from the resolution regime and more generally just what happens in these, uh, these different markets. We're making progress there, but I think it's the making markets more robust is, is from my perspective, the most important thing. It's the interconnectedness or the contagion rather than the size or the complexity of the institution itself. Mary, let me just comment on this. Well, the, 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 federal, the, the Financial Services Oversight Board obviously is designed in many ways to identify product lines and institutions that pose systemic risk on a large scale outside of the traditional banking system, which I think is going to help in all of this. But let, let me just take, because uh, I'm concerned about this point in well, I mean, the, the, the domino effect uh, of having uh, other institutions collapse. I realize that the money market issue is an interesting argument, but we didn't see this. I mean, you don't, didn't have a domino effect in the midst of the worst crisis since the Great Depression. And so while I, I think it's a point worth raising, uh, I'm not convinced that that's really a great danger or threat in all of this. Uh, but that's, what AIG, that's why we intervened in AIG, for precisely this, this concern about the knock-on consequences for the, the system as a whole, because everyone was interconnected to it through the, the credit default swaps. We didn't see it because the Fed intervened. Yeah. Well, I know, but I'm not sure if we had let AIG, instead of doing what we did, uh, it would be interesting whether or not you would have had that effect. I'm not sure that's the case. And, and that's, that's the point, because that's the argument, in a sense, I think the most telling argument is that could be the effect. And obviously, you wanna, don't want to have to test that necessarily. Exactly. But, but nonetheless, the idea is as well that, uh, uh, th that this can work, uh, in my view. One point that I, again, I, I mentioned the funding of the SEC, which I regret we didn't get done. The other one is, is the bankruptcy code itself. I mean, I had hoped in the midst of this bill that we'd have some reform of the Bankruptcy Act, because that's personally a one-off sort of a process here. And obviously, there are potential for having a domino effect. Uh, and the bankruptcy laws as presently written doesn't accommodate that terribly well. And so if I were recommending to my former colleagues in the Congress something they might want to take a good hard look at, it would be the Bankruptcy Act uh, in terms of whether or not it's, it's well suited to deal with the potential problems you could have with the domino could I just, effect. I want to emphasize something um, Randy said because I think it's really important. The Prime Reserve Fund was, um, it was a, a reasonably big money market fund. It was $62 billion in assets. But just about 1% of that was Lehman Paper. Okay. And so when Lehman declared bankruptcy and that paper was devalued, that was enough for them to break the buck and to cause this fear throughout the uh, money market fund industry, which was in fact a $4 trillion industry, that an enormous redemption started to happen. Co um, funds had to sell assets to meet redemptions into sort of a fire sale situation. And but for Treasury stepping in, um, it's not at all clear what, what would have happened. But short-term credit markets froze, as I said before, and, um, and that interconnectedness, even in a sort of indirect way that we hadn't been traditionally thinking about, 
um, created huge risks for the financial system. Mary, why don't you take a minute and uh, lay out what your plan had been to reform the money market fund and, and why, uh, why it didn't happen? Sure. Well, I, um, in 2010, the SEC actually took some very important steps to bolster the resiliency of money market funds. We increased credit, putting new requirements for increased credit quality, shortened maturities, uh, required stress testing. Um, but the reality is um, a money market fund is priced at a stable $1 value even when the value of the assets um, are less than a dollar per share. And um, so there's an enormous incentive to run um, if you think the fund is going to break the buck to get your $1 out even though it might only be worth, you know, 0 .999 cents, um, 99 cents. So the... Um, proposal was to let's float the, the share price. It, let's have it reflect the value of the underlying portfolio. It's called a floating net asset value or, or FNAV. Um, or let's put some capital behind that $1 price so that there's a buffer if there's another reserve problem. Um, capital would absorb um, the losses and you wouldn't create um, this run situation. I didn't have the support of my commission. Um, there were just two of us who supported it, supported it and three commissioners who didn't. Um, so I asked FSOC to intervene. Um, one of the reasons FSOC was created was to engage on systemic risks where the primary regulator was un unable for any reason to engage. FSOC put out proposals very similar uh, to the ones I did um, that I proposed, a capital buffer, floating NAV, or a very small capital buffer with a minimum balance requirement so that you could pull out 97% of your, of your holdings in a money market fund at once, but 3% had to remain behind for 30 days to share in the first losses. Uh, those went out for comment. Um, subsequently, the SEC came out with some new proposals. Uh, one is a floating net asset value, but only for institutional prime funds. Um, and uh, not government funds and not, re and not retail. And the other are uh, voluntary gates and redemption fees of associated with uh, redeeming shares. And that comment period closed recently, and, and we'll see where the uh, SEC goes with that. We've got time for one more brief question. Anybody? Go ahead. Hi, uh, Eric Wesson. I was actually just wondering briefly, one of the effects of Dodd-Frank is obviously this escalation of compliance costs which I think is having a deleterious effect on medium and small sized uh, banks. And I was wondering what sort of effect you think that will have both on capital accessible to non-large companies and also just generally on the market as a whole. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Any <laughs> well, certainly as, as I mentioned, I mean, compliance costs are up dramatically and, and, and some increase in compliance costs makes sense because I think there wasn't enough compliance with, uh, with uh, many of the basic rules earlier. So I don't want to say that compliance costs in and of themselves should be minimized. That's not, not what I meant to, to argue. But you want to think about sort of the cost-benefit uh, benefit analysis. What are we getting for some of this? Are we really focusing on the risks, or are we focusing on compliance for compliance's sake? And, um, and I think that, that is a challenge. There, there have been some differences in the way compliance has been working for larger banks and smaller banks precisely to uh, be sensitive to some of these, uh, these differences at, uh, at smaller and medium-sized banks. Um, I think we're still working through getting the, uh, getting the balance right. Uh, this is one of the issues with respect to, to Basel III. You had asked about that before. Uh, there'll be different, um, different applications for larger institutions versus smaller institutions. Again, trying to be sensitive to these, uh, these differences in, uh, in, uh, in situations and so differences in appropriateness of, uh, of compliance and compliance costs. Um, it, it's still to be, um, uh, to be worked out. Let me just uh, you know, comment. I know we, this conversation is all about uh, stability of the financial institutions. Uh, something that's sort of been left out of the conversation, and understandably so, given the title of the conference we're having. 26 million people lost their jobs. Right? $13 million in accumulated wealth in this country disappeared <laughs> almost overnight. Uh, we sometimes forget the human impact of a lot of this. Lives were destroyed. <laughs> Savings were wiped out of people. So I don't think we ought to be unmindful about compliance costs, uh, but let's, let's not forget what we went through. We're blessed in this country with both 
uh, with, with having no memory. That, that works for us and against us in many occasions. Okay. But, but having some memory of just what happened five years ago, and it didn't happen just in the fall of 2008. This began a lot earlier than that, uh, than just what occurred in September of 2008. And, and, and the wreckage and the carnage, not just here but elsewhere around the globe, that's being felt still as a result of that. So while I understand we need to be thoughtful about the cost of compliance, let's not forget the cost, that what we went through, what these people in the country went through as a result of this crisis. Too often that's been forgotten in the dis debate and discussion. It should not be forgotten, in my view. Yeah. Well, that's about the b most yeah. perfect note to end on yeah. that I can imagine. Yeah. So listen, thank you very much. Thank you, panel. Thank you.